So my talk today, um, as was mentioned, is redefining NGS target enrichment capture efficiency and uniformity using twist bioscience as oligoprobes. To start, um, just for people who don't, don't know who Twist is, Twist is a synthetic DNA company that was founded in 2013. It's based in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Our production facilities are in uh, South San Francisco. We have programmers and our software division, which is based in Tel Aviv, um, Emily LaProust, who's uh, shown here. She said it was probably a lot easier to buy a uh, programming company and a software company than it was to try and uh, recruit programmers out of the Bay Area, so that's why our uh, basis is in Tel Aviv. We just opened a tech site uh, for uh, support in San Diego, and we have now started to expand into Singapore. Um, as of today, we've raised over $260 million in external funding, so um, our upward trajectory is looking positive. So, how do we write our DNA? So I'm gonna jump right into this. We'll talk about NGS. Uh, a couple of our historical uh, uh, product offerings are genes, synthetic genes, oligopools, uh, saturation libraries, but we have recently got into target enrichment. So we're using our uh, proprietary methodology for synthesizing oligos to now get into the target enrichment space. And how do we do that? So traditional methodology uses a 96 well plate. So in um, one well of this plate, you will have one oligo, and you will recapitulate that uh, over the course of all 96 wells if you're gonna do a single batch of a single set of oligos expanding, or if you wanna do 96 individual oligos, each well will have one. And your bandwidth is gonna be predicated on how many synthesizers you have, how fast you can get through a 96 well plate, and how large your target enrichment pool needs to be. Uh, twist, though, on the other hand, we base our plate, which pretty much has the same footprint of a 96 volt plate, um, using a silicon wafer. And on this wafer, we have approximately 8,000 little wells. And in these 8,000 little wells, you will see 121 individual slots or indices where we can synthesize an oligo, which means that we can generate in 36 hours over a million oligos. So you can see the massive scaling that we have at our avail to, avail to do different types of technology, which includes target enrichment. A lot of questions that I end up getting is, you know, okay, Mark, well, why are your oligos better than anybody else's? Because this is a saturated market. There are a lot of players that have been here already before us. And our CEO was not gonna just join this market if it was gonna be a Me Too technology. So here's how we think of our oligos as better. Um, I think of this in the way of perf optimized performance and optimized productivity. So optimized performance is that we have uniform probe synthesis, and I'll get into all of these uh, in the slides that follow. We do in silico percent GC binning so that we understand what the secondary structure is of the regions of interest that you're trying to capture, and we will tune the stoichiometry of the probes as a result to give you uniform capture and sequencing. It may not be uniform probe representation, but that isn't the key. The key is uniform sequencing. And we can also empirically and iteratively rebalance any given design in a very quick turnaround time. And that is a nice segue into what I call our, our optimized productivity. So we're agnostic to all current LC methodologies. Um, however, we do all ha also have our own. So you have, we're trying to give the, the, the consumer the opportunity to choose what they want. Do they want to do their own homebrew? Would they like to piecemeal our probes with some of our own reagents and use some others from other vendors? Or do they just want to go all in with twist? We're not going to bind you into anything, but you do have that flexibility. We offer free of charge uh, twist mediated custom design, which usually takes anywhere from 12 to 36 hours. We NGS QC every target enrichment pool, which means the pool that you get in your hand has been sequenced. We know what the probes are, we know their sequences, we know their ratios. Uh, we also go from pilot to production scale, so our smallest scale is about 16 hybridization reactions. Our largest scale is the sky's the limit. So we're not gonna lock you into a minimum or a maxima before we start working with you. And finally, our turnaround time is less than or equal to three weeks, regardless of what your design size is. So as I get into NGS target enrichment, a lot of people like to start identifying those particular metrics which qualify a good capture. And usually everybody migrates to percent on target. And what I would like to say today is that it's not just about percent on target. Although it is part of a multivariable function which does determine capture efficiency. So percent on target in essence is defined as the on target reads you get over the total aligned reads after duplicates have been removed. However, there's a lot of variability in that because it really depends on how you define your target. 
Additionally, I find that a better way of representing percent on target is what is your target at a specific depth? Because everybody has a critical threshold that they need to meet to make accurate variant calls. It doesn't matter that you have 100% of your target covered at 1x, how many people are going to make a reliable variant call at 1x? The whole idea is that in most cases for germline mutations, you're looking at 20 to 30, and for somatic mutations, you can be anywhere up to 1,000x. Something else that impacts your target enrichment is your duplicate read percentage. Duplicate reads, especially in hybridization-based capture, and I'm putting that caveat here, because amplicon-based capture, you need redundant reads because that's the def defining factor of the way you do that variant calling. But hybridization-based captures want to have unique reads. So that a unique read is one that does not have the same directionality, it does not have the same start, and it does not have the same stop. Anything which meets all those criteria are collapsed into a consensus read. So you could have 100 redundant reads in hybridization capture, but if they're identical, they'll be collapsed into one. So all of a sudden, your 100x becomes 1x. And this will negatively impact your depth of coverage, also your variant calling accuracy, and your sequencing bandwidth. bandwidth. Because we don't want to be wasting sequencing bandwidth on the sequencer, doing an awful lot of sequencing of clustered redundant reads. This in, is impacted primarily by PCR duplicates. And then lastly, coverage uniformity. The most uniform coverage is going to be the one that has the least stochasticity in its representation. Additionally, it's going to have the one that is going to most utilize the bandwidth of your sequencer because in truth or in practice, your coverage and, and capture efficiency is the most uniform across that whole design. One way to do the calculation is to use what we call the fold 80 penalty. This is a Picard metric that the Broad Institute has been championing for quite some time. Twist really likes using that to show how our capture compares to other vendors. Perfect uniformity, which is not a reality, is one. But the closer you get to one, which is really what we want to be looking at, um, tells you how uniform your capture and sequencing is. So as we get into talking about our product, what I want to show is how biased oligo pools lead to non-uniform capture. I also call this garbage in, garbage out. So when you start with a synthesis, it's a chemical reaction. The synthesis does not care what the GC content is. It will just do the phosphoamidite chemistry on whatever phase you want, in liquid, pseudo-solid phase, or solid phase, and generate pretty much this nice distribution of oligos based on GC content. However, there's usually not enough of that to do anything with, so you need to amplify it to generate the sufficient biomass to do some reactions or chemistry with it, and that's where PCR then rears its head. And when it rears its head, you can start getting pro-bias, and as a result, this stochastic representation or this biased probe representation will result in capture bias. And that's where we see here, where you have this very nice uniform coverage at your critical threshold of 20x, you may have under-sequencing, and then you have over-sequencing. Your capture needs to sing to the back of the room, so as a result, you're going to over-sequence to try and get as much of your capture to meet that critical threshold. But that means anything that is over that critical threshold has been wasted. What Twist has been able to do is find a proprietary way that we can maintain the uniformity of the synthetic oligos through amplification so that your downstream capture and sequencing is as uniform as you can get. I maybe should have chosen a darker gray, but for more uniform coverage distribution, I, maybe lighter lights, um, AT and GC rich regions are typically difficult to cover. So high AT, high AT rich regions and high GC rich regions are going to give you this disparate bias. And what you can see for this competitor's uh, target, in essence, the data I'm showing up here is the same design, just different synthesis methodologies. You see a positive slope from low to high GC. That is not necessarily what you want. It's, that means that your probes are not being equivalently or uniformly represented. Twist, on the other hand, has this nice flat slope or zero slope distribution where a lot of our reads are lining in a very tight distribution across the design regardless of what your GC content is. Another pro for Twist versus other vendors is that we use double-stranded DNA probes, not single-strand DNA probes. And what I'm trying to show here is that you have a mutation in one strand of your DNA. And when you melt the DNA and you subject it to a probe to do hybridization, prior to twist, you're really only capturing one strand, whether it's the plus or the minus. So when everybody talks about how precious their sample is, what they're not really thinking about is that they're tossing half of it away when they expose it in a hybridization reaction. You could be using that to generate more data. 
Twist has double strand oligos, so what we're going to do is we're not only going to melt the DNA and expose that in a hybridization reaction, but we're now going to melt our oligos and in essence attack both strands, capture both strands, and get the information from both strands. And that has an awful lot of positive downstream implications, one of which is that if you capture twice the amount of your seeded molecule, you won't need as many PCR cycles. And that for anybody who does target enrichment and next generation sequencing should be music to your ears because that means that one, you won't incorporate error into what could be your accurate variant calls, but secondly, you aren't going to spike the duplicates that can poison your sequencing which results in redundant reads which have to be collapsed and then you have poor bandwidth off your instrument. Here's an example of two design or of the same design captured with either twist or competitor's probes. And what we found was with the competitor, you needed 12 cycles to generate approximately 9 nanograms per microliter. With us, you needed 8 cycles to generate almost 3 times that. So with 2 thirds of the PCR cycles, I generated 3 times the, down, the output of this particular capture. That means that I don't have to do as many cycles, I'm probably not going to have as many redundant reads, and I'm going to get a, a lot more unique molecules going into your sequencing, which is going to give you an awful lot more unique capture and variant results. A lot of people who do not target enrichment sequencing also are probably very familiar with this type of plot. This is a coverage distribution plot with percentage of targeted bases relative to your design on the y-axis and depth of coverage on the x. Perfection is if you can maintain at 100% that kind of distribution to the point where you want to be your critical threshold of depth of coverage and then it falls off the cliff completely and precipitously. No wasted reads whatsoever. But up to that point, everything has been covered. Unfortunately, perfection is not what we work in. So what you try and do is maintain the steep, the 100% the, the of coverage maintained as long as possible, but to have the distribution curve fall off as steeply as possible to zero. And this is where you can get up here on the upper left-hand corner improved coverage because you're, in essence, shifting coverage at a higher percentage. But you don't want to have overrepresented over reads here and you're shifting it over to the left. So what we're saying here is, no pun intended, we want you to twist your enrichment coverage distribution to actually take advantage of our technology to give you far more represented reads. So I also want to show here uniform capture efficiency versus dropouts. This is an also another exemplar with regards to the same design done by two different vendors. What you do not want to see in um, uniform or in the idea of a capture is this sad face or a frown, so to speak, in your capture. You want to see something that's more equivalently distributed. Very equivalent to what I'm talking about when I say probe uniformity, probe distribution being uniform across GC, resulting in sequencing uniformity. So you want to avoid sad captures. And with twist, you get very serious captures. So that's what we're looking for, very, very equivalent distribution across the design. Additionally, with twist, what we're finding is that we're not seeing an awful lot of probe dropout. You're seeing, relative to a competitor, those regions which are difficult to capture, either high or low GC-rich regions, we're not seeing those drop out when you do a correlation plot. We're actually capturing those. And why we are is because we're able to stoichiometrically tune the probes that are going to capture those very difficult regions to force the capture from the left-hand side, which is hybridization, to the right-hand side, which is capture. So what we're seeing is, relative to this example, whereas the competitor lost 23 exons, or almost 2.5 kb, we missed none. I'm going to cut to the chase on this slide, because what all of this means is that you're going to reduce your costs associated with sequencing. So if I can give you more uniform capture, which results in more uniform sequencing, you're going to be able to sequence more samples with the same fixed bandwidth of your sequencer, in this case, approximately 30%. That translates to samples per lane of almost 40% increase. If you can increase your sample output here, that's e equivalent to both operational efficiency in the sense of turnaround time, but also cost effectiveness. So to close, what I'm going to do is just show two quick slides. One, this is our whole exome philosophy, so I've been showing a lot of custom uh, parameters, but we do offer a whole exome based on a CCDS design. It's approximately 33 megabase. 
You can buy that off the shelf right now, it gets to you in 24 hours. However, we can customize it any way you want. And this can either be spiked in or it can be blended. To just show an idea of how our performance is, and I know this is a very busy slide, what I really want to get to is to show you that our exome has been optimized to do an eight sample pre-hybridization multiplex. We know that as you increase the plex of a sample, that that sample complexity increases. And usually you'll start seeing a lilic dropout. But because we were able to optimize the eight plex, when you compare it to a single plex, you don't see any dropout. You end up getting eight plex data with the performance of single plex quality. However, relative to competitors who try and do these multiplexes, you start seeing that they do start seeing drop-offs. And relative to us, they never quite meet the nut. And so what we do see is that we usually get far better data at 20 and 30x relative to the competitors, but additionally, we don't require as much sequencing to get set amount of data. So to close, what I'd like to do is pretty much follow up with our hashtag, which is to say, dare to compare. How do you design tomorrow's experiments using yesterday's tools? And maybe what you can start to consider is using today's tools, which is what TWIST is here to offer. The idea of exceptional performance using double-strand probes with exceptional uniformity and high probe efficiency, flexibility of kits and designs, and maximizing your sequencing output so that you can save on both sequencing costs but also target enrichment costs. And so that's it. Thank you. Thank you.